As we head down the side of the pyramid, if you go to the right here and drop off the ledge, you'll see this area you can only access by dropping down. And up to the top we have, how about that, our fourth heart piece. We're up to a very healthy 10 hearts now, halfway to the max heart total. Obviously you'll note that the dark world mirrors the light world in a lot of ways. With some exceptions, the popsicle bridge has been destroyed in this world, sadly. Enemies are, on balance, a bit more dangerous. A bit tougher, to shut a bit more damage. The shops, the buildings have been altered in some cases, well all cases, but so that's not going to be the magic user's place here. We're going to head up as if we we're heading to Zora's Domain, or the Zora's Falls. We're going to grab our second medallion, my favorite, the Quake Medallion, which I referenced earlier. We can do this by picking up just any old object, like the skull right here, and tossing it into this ring of stones. Give it a second. See the fish pop out, and then you'll see a much larger fish pop out. Disturb my peaceful. This number will give us the medallion and blaze the quake. All right, the quake medallion freezes enemies, and uh, it unlocks one dungeon in particular late in the game, and it's my favorite of all the medallions. I love that animation of Link just thrusting that into the ground, freezing all the enemies. The quake medallion. Thank you, Blaze and Fluff. I'm told you have a relevant fact about this. The catfish who gives you the earthquake medallion is actually a reference to a bit of 18th century Japanese folklore which tells the story of Namazu, a huge catfish which wiggles its body to cause earthquakes and bring about destruction. The circle of stones acts as a prison which represents the stone the god Kashima used to restrain Namazu. Japan's Earthquake Early Warning Systems logo is fittingly none other than Namazu himself. Very cool, thank you Fluff. And things that we probably didn't pick up on as kids. I don't know if that's common knowledge when you were maybe a Japanese child in the early 90s playing this on the Super Famicom, but certainly news to me. We're coming up on the first dungeon, the Dark Palace, it's called. The names of these places are kind of all over the place. I think there would be something cool back here. This is the bizarro version of Sahasrala's place. I see a bombable wall, but I'm going to be somewhat disappointed. We find that there is only... A bit of health back here, yeah, a couple hearts. Four hearts, actually. Not exactly worth the, uh, worth the effort, but that's all right. Didn't need them in that case. So we actually need to have 110 rupees for this next part before we can actually gain access to the Dark Palace. They really stick it to you in this point of the game. We're dropping 500 bucks. Just cut through here. You can go up through there, but it's a dead end, so you have to come all the way around and go through here. 500 bucks for the Zora Slippers, and then note as we come through here, we pick up a companion. Kiki the Monkey, who loves rupees more than anything, so sure, let's give him 10 rupees. What do we care, right? Makes me laugh, though. It's kind of the equivalent of someone saying, I love money more than anything. Okay, yeah. That's fair, so he's going to ask us for another 100 Unfortunately, it's the only way to actually gain access to the Dark Palace. So let him do his thing. His monkey thing hopping around. We are now in the first Palace of the Dark World. First thing we're going to do is head through the right here. We can just smack these little guys. They have a little mask on. Little helmet SARS. You have to hit them from the back, unless you have... A skull, which is, I suppose, the pots of the dark world. Just smack him in the face with one of those and you'll take him down. Don't have to worry about getting behind them, repositioning or anything like that. We're going to head back down and around to the right this time. Basically hit the sides before we 
head on down the center path. Let's again, just give him a smack. If you need a fairy, you can grab one right there. Otherwise, just hop on the teleport switch right there. You Note know, the bombable wall there at the bottom. Now Zelda's communicating with us through these things. She's being held at Turtle Rock. We're a ways off from that, unfortunately, but we'll get there, Zelda, one thing at a time. Gotta save the other six maidens first. Nothing to be bombed on the left side, just this door right here. These guys mirror your movements. You can kind of get caught up on obstacles and things like that to get them to move. But the best strategy is just fire an arrow when you're not lined up with the red ones, especially because they will shoot fire at you if you make eye contact. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're those guys. Yeah, just uh, get them to walk into your arrow. Get ourselves the map here in the first palace of the Dark World. Got bombable walls on both sides here. Left side's gonna take us to a key, the right side to a fairy. If you need to grab one or two. This might be one of the palaces where we have some keys left over at the end, depending on the route that we take. Or three. Again, leave them. Have a companion. These uh, weird Doofy, I'm not sure what you want to call those things. Need the hammer to knock them out. Blaze is going to talk about that once we get it, but that is the the treasure of this, the Dark Palace. Hopefully setting that theme early here in the Dark World, the Dark Palace. I'm just going to head back the way we came. Put the teleport switch right there. Head back upstairs, and now we're ready to head on up. Grab that 20 piece right there. Now we just want to bank rupees from this stage of the game and on so that we can afford item upgrades. We don't have to buy too much. I'm gonna bomb the floor right here and drop through. basement floor right here. Use our remaining key to unlock this door and get the boss key, or the, the big key of this palace. Now we just hop right off and drop back down to this area where we can find another key once we hit that pressure switch. Cannot hurt those turtles until we have the hammer to smack them on their backs. So, And now we're back in this room again, so we're just going to head back the way we came and I'm not sure who's obsessively cleaning up after us but uh, you'll find if you go to the left that the floor has been repaired you can walk over that again we're just gonna take the right side this time grab a key right here and then jump across the arrow signifies that you can do just that and hop across we're going to go right across through this locked door. As soon as we toss this, just get your, your sprint on. Because the floor is going to start collapsing behind you if you linger right there. Another dark room. You think their flames could provide some temporary light, but not the case. There's some bombs in the top left chest right here. There's actually a key, which you don't want to miss, in the bottom right corner of this little maze-like area here. No lanterns to be lit here. Another thing you don't want to miss, hug the right wall right here. Probably wouldn't know that there's a bombable wall here unless you took the time to notice that there was a chest when we ran across that bridge. So you're just, you know, kind of doing the, the math in your head as to the way this place is laid out. But anyway, Blaze, how about that hammer? All right, the magic hammer. Knock down those annoying blocks, which are all over Hyrule and the Dark World, but definitely need this for getting around 
You can use it on the uh, the upcoming boss, which Gary will talk about. But there you go, the magic hammer. Always magic. Thank you, Blaze. Everything is magic. Not to get all Tom along on you, but... Seems to be the case. We have the compass to pick up in this next room here. Pick it up on the way back. These turtles are more annoying than anything. Got a whole bunch of cash we can grab down here, which is... Pretty clutch after we've been hit up by Zoras and monkeys and everyone's been bleeding us dry. Grab another key down there as we make the loop. We pick up about 180 bucks right there, something like that. It's more trouble to flip these turtles. I just assume walk around them, get the compass. Nothing's to be, no special items to be had if we do flip them. I think this is just five bucks. Yeah. We can kind of squish this little spiky block right there. Keep it from doing too much harm. I'm gonna hop to the middle now and flip the switch at the bottom. These guys might knock us, there we go. Use our boomerang right here. Circle about. This will progress things to the next area. This is the first instance where we need to move one of these statues, so... To apply pressure to this top switch up here. Let's just take this top right statue, give it a... Just push into it. You'll start to move it. Same idea with these guys, just like to use the, the skull pots. See, he got a shot off on us there. It's a lot easier just create some distance and then just move accordingly. A couple shots will take him down, they give you plenty of arrows. So we can move on here. Just give this a shot to flip it. Then give this statue a nice shot in the eye to open up the next area. A little staircase down. So we're getting closer to the boss here. Definitely need to have the hammer before we can make any progress here. You can see, flip the turtle, just give them a couple stabs once they're on their backs. Defenseless. Flip back over to our boomerang so we can progress through here. Just a little corridor. Not even worth the time taking it down. There'll be plenty more opportunities for money. We don't really have to stock up at this stage just through the course of playing the game we should have more than enough money by the end to afford everything that we want all the upgrades we do need to take out all of the turtles here unfortunately so a nice charge on the swing before they flip back over you can take them down with one hit in that case Like a lot of games, the turtles get very upset once they flip back onto their feet. Kind of the bubble bobble rule, if you will. If you'll allow that. <laughs> Another game which we did a class on here on Video Games 101. Make sure you have that hammer out. We have two, uh, two pair of turtles right here. Some cash, and we're on our way to the next boss. Let's throw it back to Gary. For the first boss of the Dark World. Boss beaters. All right, the Helmasar King. Couple options here. First, it's safer if you just want to use some well-placed and timed bombs and uh, to blow off that helmet. Otherwise, if you're feeling a bit more adventurous, like we show here, just charge at him with that hammer and uh, start smacking the, to break that helmet apart. Then just stab the face. Uh, once that tail starts moving around, get close to the face because it's going to whip uh, to the left or right of you and uh, just avoid those projectiles. If you go to the bottom of the screen and he's farther back, those projectiles will pretty much avoid you, but uh, yeah, not a difficult boss. Says that as we 
die, quote-unquote. I don't really call it that, though, considering we have the fairies. If I really thought that that was a death, I would have had some potion or brought up a fairy ahead of being knocked down. We're all right. It's one of my favorite bosses, though. There's something very satisfying about getting the hits in on that, uh, on that green gem on his face there. Yeah, bombs work. Hammer works, obviously. Just like that, he's down, and those spikes won't hurt you anymore. Can rub up on him. Unlike during the battle, I don't know, they just cork him as soon as the guy dies. We're into our second row now, with hearts. That's exciting for us. We've rescued our first maiden. And they'll kind of drone on and on about the story and fill in some details. Didn't care about this at all when I was a kid. I don't know about the rest of us, but just wanted to get back to stabbing and bombing. Hookshotting before too long. You got it. And don't think just because we're in the dark world that people stop condescending to us. They'll still check, are you sure you got all that? Profess. Or just prof. Alright. No sign of Kiki the monkey on the way out. I wonder what he spends his rupees on. Maybe he just has a big collection of them, Scrooge McDuck style, and just kind of dives into him and swims around. The richest monkey in the world, or the dark world. I don't know. Exit the same way we came in. So now that we have the hammer, we have a whole new section of the, the Dark World, which we have access to. So we'll take this opportunity to grab a few more items here and there. Stay ahead of the curb, as the Briggs notes suggested. This is where we use our hammer to access more of the Dark World. Cut on through, and we're going to head to the left here. There's a bomb shop in our home. <laughs> Not sure what that says about us, if everything's sort of a, a reflection of the light world, that where we live is a place where you can pick up destructive items, but anyway, we're going to cut up here for one of the saddest parts of this game, if you ask me. This one always, always made me feel it. So this... Poor child wants us to help find his flute, so he gives us the shovel, Blaze. I think I can figure it out for myself, but still. All right, the shovel is used to dig, uh, specifically to find the flute, which is another item I'll talk about in just a moment. Yes, he will, because it's right here. Just use your magic mirror right here, and you'll see sort of the spirit of the child right here. And here's a fun little fact. If we pull out... The good bee, which we rescued earlier, when I say rescue, we sort of entrapped, and pull him out, he will fly directly to the point where you need to dig to find the flute. So right there, and the flute, Blaze, what do you got? All right, the flute allows us to fast travel around the light world in Hyrule. Very useful item, yes. Once we free the bird, which we'll do in just a moment, but in the meantime, let's give this uh, poor child one final concert with his flute. Transforms into a little tree. Super sad. Anyway, we, uh, we have adventuring to do. There's been a lot of victims of the general evilness of Ganon and, and his cohorts, so. He'll get his. Don't worry. 
We have a great place for making some money right there at the, the shooting range. It's why you really don't need to go out of your way to find any money because in the shooting range you can make pretty much all the money you need and more. We'll show you how to do that in just a moment. Right now, we're going to try our luck digging around this field. It costs 80 rupees, which is not cheap, but generally you can more or less break even if you're quick and have a little bit of luck. The position of the rupees and other items like get magic refills, it changes every time. The one thing which we're especially looking for is a quarter of a heart piece or a heart piece to go to our total. So it may take you a few times to find it. If you don't find it the first time, then uh, just leave the field. Fortunately, they, they don't let you just keep redigging. They have to put the grass down and everything. So let's jump ahead. And then here we go. There's the heart piece again. It's going to change every time its position, but that's all we wanted there. A much better place to make money is that aforementioned shooting range. And the trick to doing that as we head inside, I'll show you right here. Well, howdy, Lie Worlder. So it costs us 20 bucks, but if we can hit, and not not a great not a great start here. Every time you hit one in succession without a miss, it doubles the rupees that you get. So when you have uh, what, five arrows right here, so we get four, eight, 16, 32, and 64, and you add all that up. So we're making over 100 rupees each time. The trick is to shoot when there's basically one curtain length between you and the target behind it. Mind the hands, obviously, but that's the spacing that you need, basically. Just make sure that it's one of those curtain pieces between you and the target. You can pretty reliably get 124 rupees every single time. So let's jump ahead here and max out our rupee total at 999. And there we go. That is the max, unfortunately. He doesn't say anything about that. But still pretty good for a start, you know. We already have the adult wallet. As opposed to other Zelda games where they, uh, they restrict how much money kids can have. I always like picking up the adult wallet, though, with the description, you know. Adults are allowed to carry more money. <laughs> oh, really? More responsible. I suppose they think adults are. Or if you're just a kid with an adult wallet, too. Kind of makes you wonder what the point is, but... Alright, so we're gonna pop into the sort of tavern here and talk to this older gentleman who, if we play the flute for him, yeah, it's his son's flute. It's a sad story. But he does give us a tip to go play the song in the town square, which we could help him out seeing his son one more time, but... Don't worry, Ganon will pay in blood. Well, not blood, it's Nintendo, but, uh... Yeah, we'll stab him a bunch of times. It'll be satisfying. Get the nice full theme here from Koji. And the bird breaks free. And now it will scoop in whenever we play the flute and take us to one of eight destinations all around Hyrule. Makes getting around a lot easier. Unfortunately, we can only do it in the light world. There's no kind of, you know, comparatively badass looking bird. Like a skeleton bird or something in the in the dark world, like a raven. Like a really ripped raven with guns and stuff. I'm just spitballing here. That would be too easy though. When a lot of the map is still inaccessible to us. We made some good progress there. We're gonna head now to oh you're right, we can talk to these trees here. Some of them are more polite than others. They'll pretty much always spit out bombs at you. It's just the ones that are animated. They have the eyes that are that look alive. Some of them are much kinder though when you run into them and just want to chat with you for a second. 
give you some tips here and there about the Dark World. Can't resist the 20 bucks, even when I have 999 showing. So we'll need to head back to, as we come to the Light World here, as so we can grab another medallion right here, the final medallion of the three. The least useful, let's be honest. Whereas the other two were useful for and necessary for advancing the plot. This one's just all about the flames. Blaze? All right, the Bombos Medallion is the one which doesn't unlock any particular dungeons or anything like that, but it burns enemies with a ring of fire. Looks pretty cool, but there you go, the Bombos Medallion. Probably never use it again, but uh, there you go. All right, so we're going to use our flute now to get transported to the eighth spot. And now we're finally going to head to that island here at Lake Hylia. Very underwhelming compared to, say, Lake Hylia and Ocarina of Time, subsequent Zelda games. But if we head in here, we'll find a fountain at the end of this path, the Pond of Happiness. It takes a while to throw these rupees in. I speed this up here in a second. If you just stay at the front, it'll automatically prompt you again. So basically, every time we throw in 100 rupees, we have a chance to increase either our bombs or our arrows by a count of five. Now, it seems like it takes a long time because we only get to throw in 20 at a time right now, and didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Stretching this out, and that's just completely random. The luck that they give you has no bearing on anything when it comes to the game. We make our own luck, class. Slash get a lot of it from watching this link to the past walkthrough which we appreciate please subscribe if you haven't do one of these classes every single week we'd love to have you enrolled so let's speed this up at 100 a fairy will appear that should get us there and we can carry more bombs or arrows if you ask me the bombs are more useful early on in the game, seeing as we have a cap at 10 right now, and we have a cap of 30 on the arrows, so. So now they up you to 50, which speeds this whole process along. Jump ahead now that we have 50 on the bombs, and we'll just keep adding to our arrows once we have more money a little bit later. Now we're gonna start to head over to the Great Swamp and set things up for the second palace in the Dark World, but a few more errands to run in this area first. Especially now that we have the hammer. Not to mention the, uh, the flippers. So let's head on up here and hammer our way through a couple of these stakes. And lift this rock with the power glove to access the Dark World. It's important to remember where some of these are as well, as they can act as shortcuts when you need to get back to the dark world from the light world here and there. So we're going to need to go back to the light world to empty out the pond and then have the change reflected here in the dark world. And uh, interesting fact about when we drain that pond, specifically to the wildlife affected by that, let's go to Fluff for another Fluff fact. Fluff? If you're feeling a bit cruel and up for a walk, you can take and offer the fish to the street merchant in Kakariko Village, who will give Link an assortment of arrows, bombs, and rupees. There you go. Slightly better than the 20 spot that the fish gave us for sparing its life. But uh, not that we're in need of the money right now, necessarily. You can always go back to that shooting range, but yeah, we come back to the light world here to empty out the dam and see how we doing on uh, fairies right now. Do we need this one? There we go. Let's empty this out and everything gets reflected back in the dark world. In 
And now if we head inside the Swamp Palace, we should have access. There we go. Got some water here. I like that sound of the spiky block bouncing off the walls right there. So defeat those enemies to get yourself your first key here. These enemies are known as Hobas, the little water strider looking guys. Bomb our way through here. This looks very similar to the, at least that last room, the, uh, the underneath the cathedral. We still need to revisit at some point to grab ourselves some, some cash. We'll get back there, but there's a key stored in this bottom pot right there, bottom skull. So much more manageable, this temple, or palace, I should say, over the, the water temple from Ocarina of Time. So we grab the key right there. Yeah, that one gave me fits as a kid, as it did a lot of, a lot of players in the 90s and even today. Getting that water level just right so you can access that area that you've never been before. This is much more relaxing, I have to say, by comparison. As the water fills up like a tub, we can now exit out to the bottom and uh, swim around there. You'll see we have the bombable wall here, which is good for, I think, just, yeah, five bucks and a bomb, so not the most thrilling of treasures right there, but in the interest of showing you everything there is in this game. So we swim up over here and continue on. This is sort of the main chamber of the Swamp Palace. One of the greatest items in uh, the history of video games, not just the Legend of Zelda series, is contained within that massive novelty-sized chest there. It's really far too big for the, uh, <laughs> the item which it contains, as are most of those oversized chests, but we appreciate the uh, the entertainment value no nonetheless as we get the compass here. Like that foley of us trudging through the water right here. Good sound effects. They really upped their game when they made that jump from the 8 to the 16 bits of the Super Nintendo. Before we continue on, again we want to pick up this skull and grab another key before we flood this area. It's actually necessary, but yeah, just this is the order right here. Grab that key and we're going to come back to the main chamber and head up north here and to the left. Unlock this door right now. Grab our boomerang and trigger this so we can flood this area here so we can swim through. Before you leave here, make sure you hit this switch again to invert the, uh, the block position. And you'll see why we did this in just a moment. Now we swing all the way back down to where we were before and hop into the water. Sometimes you'll find uh, little jellies pop up out of the floor once you can trigger them by walking in the right spot. In later dungeons, we actually have to do that to uh, grab a key or special items in certain situations, so just something to keep in mind. And now we're heading upstairs long area here. We're going to go up and to the right. There's 20 rupees to be had if we drop down on the left side, so I'm going to assume we can do without those, but you can see why we tripped the uh, the block position right there, so we can access this very important item, the big key for the Swamp Palace right here. 
Now we can head back to that main chamber and collect, again, one of just the greatest items in Legend of Zelda slash video game history of all time for my money. For my rupees, I should say. There she is. Blaze, you have the honors. All right, the hook shot, one of the coolest original items from the Legend of Zelda series. This is its first appearance and uh, it can bring things towards you. It can bring you towards other things. You can only beat certain bosses with it. It's a very cool item. Love the hook shot. How can you not? Thank you very much, boys. You can see we hooked to the right there after collecting the hook shot to get to that skull right there to get the key. It's nice if you ever have one of these electrifying enemies doing their thing, then you can just smack them with the hook shot and say, stop it. And don't worry about getting shocked, must have a rubber handle or something. So we're gonna head through this door right here first. push through the little one. There's a lot going on here. I'm going to empty the drain right here with this switch. Normally these fill up an area with water. In this case, they're going to drain it. So we can head down the stairs and access this next area. To this long corridor. We have some cash here to the right we can collect. A couple 20 rupees in each of these chests. But we want to go all the way to the top here. Just a handful of items to be found in these skulls right here. A little bit of cash too. And I always liked this. You have to go behind the little mini waterfall right there to find the hidden door. But you can kind of see if you're on the left side to know that, you know, there's something more going on with this general area. But still, cool little design right there. Let's charge right through this little connecting area. There's a key in this skull over here to the right. Pop in and swim all the way to the left. We can bomb right through here to grab ourselves a handful of items right here. We need some more hearts, bombs, arrows. All the standard replenishing items right here. That's what you get. All right, we're coming up on the next boss and a very fun one at that. Let's throw it back to our resident boss expert, Gary. Boss beater, Argus. Keep your distance when it comes to Argus. You want to hook shot and pull off those balls and then stab them when you bring them towards you. This is, I gotta say, one of the most satisfying bosses in the entire Zelda series. I just love using that hook shot on this guy. Once all those little balls are gone, Charge your sword and just release that spin attack when he drops down. Not too difficult. Extremely satisfying. I completely agree. Thank you very much, Gary. Just pull them off. Get a few stabs in. Repeat the process. Put some distance between yourself. Not nearly as dangerous when there's only a couple of those floating around and you put enough distance between yourself. And now, yeah, as Gary said, just get some nice swings lined up. Don't necessarily come straight for you, the boss here. I have to say, on balance, the bosses of A Link to the Past, not that difficult. I like the way that they're designed, but yeah, nothing that's going to really throw you for a loop. 
especially if you have the basic tips which Gary covers each time. We've rescued our second maiden now. He's once again going to explain a bit more of the greater story to us and just check and make sure that we comprehended everything that she said. We're the only one who can destroy Ganondorf, the thief. No, Ganon, the evil king of darkness. Which, which one do you want us to destroy? Yeah, they were developing the lore right here. I know Fluff talked about the Ganon-Gandorf connection in a previous class. But yes, I figured a random Kako or Kakariko village person wasn't going to come to the rescue. Figured this was on us for the most part. So now that we have the hookshot, we can access even more of the map. Pretty much everything in uh, the Dark World is accessible to us, with a couple exceptions of some things which are behind heavier rocks, which we can't quite lift yet, but we can certainly access Kakariko Village now, and the Lost Woods, or the Bizarro Lost the Skull Woods, I guess it's called, in the Dark World. So this is a good time to mention that you can approach the dungeons, or palaces, or what have you, of the Dark World in different orders, if you so choose, once you have a certain number of items. Um, we could go ahead and do the third or fourth dungeon at this point. I'm going to go slightly out of order, and we're going to do the fourth dungeon first, simply because this allows us to get an item which will let us pick up heavier objects like the uh, the darker stones which we have right here that the darker skulls as the case may be right now we don't have to wait to get to this area though if you cut through here nothing to be hidden under that rock but if we use our mirror at this point and head back to the light world and not be on top of something when you do if you do that then it'll send you right back to where you warped in from if we try it right here and then put a little distance between ourselves and then dash into this tombstone right here we will gain access to a new item right here blaze what do we got in the cape all right the magic cape makes link invisible Link's such a good guy would never use this to rob a bank or anything like that not even sure why i mentioned that but we need this to uh, get through certain sections of the game to access another item a piece of a heart Otherwise, not going to be using it too often, but there you go, the magic cape. Everything's magical. I guess in this instance I will uh, concede that, yes, a cape which allows you to become invisible is probably magical. But you can see right there we climbed up the stairs, came back to the light world, and we're going to bomb through this wall here. And there we go, another piece of the heart. Half the way to a extra heart for our total to get to 13. There's more to be had around here, so we should be able to hit that before we hit our next palace, dungeon, what have you. It's not like Ocarina where they make it very clear that they're all temples, just we're kind of all over the place here. Ganon's Tower, Misery Mire, Turtle Rock to name a few. They kind of abandon the whole palace concept pretty early on here in the dark world, but that's fine. So we're going to cut through here like we're going up to Death Mountain, but in the dark world, throwing this rock to the side. Don't need the more powerful glove for this, but just head on upstairs. We're going to use our hook shot now. You come down a little bit you can see there's a bunch of skull pots right here we're actually going to make use of our magic cape right here for i think one of two times 
to get past that barrier. It's the only way, otherwise it'll just bounce right off. But there we go, our third piece of heart. There's actually one more we can grab right now. Just head up to the north here, and you'll recall that the woodcutters were working on one tree in particular back in the late world. Now that we've made some progress in the game, pull out our magic mirror, get to the side so we don't warp onto anything. Hopefully, there we go. See the tree slightly lighter colored. If we dash into it, we can head down into what turns out to be a, a hollow trunk right here. Grab some fairies if you need any at this point. Do we need any? Do not have any free bottles. All right, so we'll just grab, well, I kind of broke my own rule, but that's all right. More importantly, if we head to the right here, Another heart piece to add to our overall total. We're now at 13 hearts. Looking pretty good. I'm going to head back through the portal that we made. And head down south into the bizarro Kakariko village. The village of outcasts here in this world. Full of thieves and uh, just bad people. And monsters. So we go a little bit to the left here. There's a game of chance on the west side of town. Just come down a little bit. Where if you spend some money, you get to open a couple chests. And similar to the digging game, we have a chance at collecting a heart piece here. See how we do. Bomb. Bomb. Okay. Let's head back in. Try our luck again. Costs 30 bucks, so, I mean, there are... There we go. Alright. Second time's a charm. And 50 bucks to make up for most of our losses there. Looking good. Alright, so if we pull at this, we can gain access to the, technically what is the fourth palace, temple, what have you, of the game. Before we head inside, there are a couple of unguarded chests which pay out the most money you can find in a chest in this game. 300 rupees. And there's one more at that. I really think these wouldn't be just completely unguarded in the village of outcasts, the thieves, but you know, we're just uh we're just doing what you do in the, the village of thieves. You take stuff that's not yours, or in our case, six hundred rupees. From very minimal effort on our parts. We can get all the rest of the upgrades with the money that we have now. Not exactly pressing, though, in terms of uh, our priorities, so we're going to head into the next dungeon here. This one's actually pretty short, especially if you know where you're going. good example is this first area where it seems rather confusing if you don't know where you're going, so we're just going to drop off right here to get the map first off. There's four squares which are all connected here in one way or another. I'm going to drop in from the bottom side and go to the right. Now we're going to go straight down. Climb the stairs here. We can pretty much immediately also get the compass from this chest right down here. Once you have the compass, drop off to the left here and to finish the, uh, the, the trio. We also get the big key just like that. Not another dungeon where you get one, two, three, all of those treasures in about the span of 20 seconds, but I don't know if Nintendo thought they were. We'd turn into a bunny or revert to that form momentarily if we get hit by one of those things, but as soon as we take damage, we, we uh, revert back to our normal form. Yeah, I really don't know if Nintendo thought they were being sneaky, like they were going to trick us with the, the design of this initial area, but yeah, if you know what you're doing, there's a key just hanging out in this 
skull right there. Use it on this door. While we're working our way through this relatively short dungeon, let's go to Fluff for another Fluff fact. A Link to the Past has a glitch which allows you to walk through walls in certain areas of the game. By adhering to a very specific and very glitchy route this way, you can actually beat the game in just three minutes by walking to the ending screen. Good luck, Fluff. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've never attempted that. I can get behind a speed run, which is, you know, a proper speed run that doesn't take advantage of little hacks like that, but uh, yeah, not so much. We're going to hit that switch before we head on upstairs, by the way. But yeah, I don't see the point so much in exploits like that. Just hit this switch right here. We can move right ahead. Ignore the trap switch on that wall, the lever. Very important in this room. Drop a bomb. We can pick it up by hitting A and then toss it over the side to let light in from above. This is going to go back to a tip which we got back in the Light World version of Kakariko Village. Remember uh, the, the leader of the thieves blind could not stand the light. So that's what we're working on with that right there. Just head right back downstairs. Don't feel like talking to Sahasrala right now. Probably never pronounced that name exactly right, but that's fine. Cut through here. There's a few different ways to go. Here in the final stretch of this little dungeon, we're going to head downstairs first. And it might not seem like it, but we can easily lift this right now, even though we haven't gotten the aforementioned... It's the level 2 glove, essentially, which we get from this dungeon, which we're grabbing just so we can get that better sword upgrade. So again, playing these a little bit out of order. Just charge right through to the top. Use that master key to cut through these. And how about that? Maiden just hanging out. Nice and easy. Didn't have to even fight any bosses for this one. Nothing suspicious about this. <laughs> right, class? Come through this door. Be very quick here. Pull out that hammer. Smash one of these to cut through. Get the treasure and get out before the floor collapses and blaze. All right, the Titan Smit, an upgrade on the Power Glove. This allows Link to pick up those darker colored rocks, which I guess are heavier, but again, doesn't matter if it's a small or a larger rock, you could pick them both up now and access previously inaccessible areas. Good call, thank you very much. Yeah, we'll be using that quite effectively very soon here. And just gotta hit the switch here to get through. Head into this northern chamber here and walk the Maiden into the light which we created earlier with that bomb. And just like that, we have our next boss. Let's go back to Gary. Boss beaters. Hey, blind the thief. Charge up your sword and unleash a spin attack. Three of these per phase, or if you use two and a regular hit, you will uh, send him into his next form where another head will, uh, will be shed off the boss. And once he has one or two of these heads spinning around shooting projectiles, just be careful. Avoid those shots. Get the hits in when you can. Take him down. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, this is one of the uh, more chaotic boss fights right here for sure. With the two and now three heads floating around. A lot of projectiles going on in this room, so you just want to put them down as quickly as possible. shame and burning through a fairy on this particular battle. Next one will be easier once we get that sword upgrade, so that's what we'll be working on next.
Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and comment on this video, and click subscribe if you haven't already, as this seriously helps me to keep making great content for you. And check the description of this video to see what song is playing right now.